Over the next few weeks, we'll be talking about a topic that can be divisive for musicians. We'll be talking about the how, the what, and the why of tuning. Today we're mostly focusing on the how, but I want to start with a quick overview of the why, since for the most part, tuning theory can be seen as a response to a very specific contradiction. And as always, it goes back to timbre. We've touched on timbre a lot in previous episodes, but here's a quick primer for the uninitiated. Timbre is how a sound sounds. To illustrate, let's take a sawtooth wave and a square wave. These are the same note at the same volume, but something is clearly different. The difference is timbral, relating to the distinct quality of a sound, and we can measure it by looking at the overtones. While we tend to see notes as isolated points in the frequency spectrum, the truth is actually a little bit blurrier. A sound played at one frequency will be accompanied by sound at related frequencies. For melodic instruments, these related frequencies are found at integer multiples of your main or fundamental frequency. So for example, if our fundamental frequency is an A at 440 Hz, our overtones will be found at the second harmonic, which is 880 hertz, our third harmonic at 1320, our fourth harmonic at 1760, and so on and so on and so on. The earliest tuning systems were derived from these integer multiples. A perfect fifth can be found at the third harmonic, and a major third can be found at the fifth harmonic. In fact, a lot of our musical customs can be traced back to this harmonic series. But unfortunately, there's an issue. The notes derived from these integer ratios aren't internally consistent. To demonstrate, let's take a note and derive its third by multiplying it by 5 over 4. Then let's take that same note and stack fifths until we arrive at that same major third. As you can see, stacking fifths creates a sharper third, one that sounds much, much worse. Or how about this? Let's take a note and stack thirds up to an octave. This is a huge obstacle for ratio tunings. They create intervals that are inconsistent and occasionally unpleasant. This leads to the emergence of temperaments, tuning systems which use modified ratios to balance the conflicting needs of different intervals. And this is the primary source of tension for tuning theorists. We gain flexibility only by moving away from the ratios which are imminent in the notes themselves. The relation between fundamentals becomes consistent but our overtones no longer find a home within our scale. But it's important to note that there's nothing inherently bad about this. Equal temperament and the A440 pitch standard make it possible for a wide variety of instruments to play an even wider variety of music together. I can bring a single instrument to a jam and play in whatever key they call the tune in without being out of tune. That's a big deal. But on the other hand, if you've spent any time with pure ratio triads, you know that there's something about equal temperament that's a little unpleasant. So it's a trade-off, and depending on your particular musical goals, one option might be clearly superior to the other. Are you a jazz keyboardist that frequents jam sessions? Stick with equal temperament. Are you an experimental drone artist? Maybe experiment with some different tuning systems. Now let's check out a few different tuning methods and see what all the fuss is about. Just intonation describes any tuning system based on whole number ratios. While this might seem to narrow the field a lot, there's a lot more flexibility in this tuning system than you might expect. The most basic form of just intonation is Pythagorean, or three limit tuning. In Pythagorean tuning, all notes are derived by stacking pure fifths. We multiply by three over two to move up the circle of fifths and divide to move backwards and fourths. Eventually we meet at the tritone, but our tritone by fifths is not equivalent to our tritone by fourths. So we end up with distinct augmented fourths and diminished fifths. In this tuning, our fifths sound amazing, and for the most part, they're consistent, but our major thirds are extremely sharp. For some perspective, a pure ratio third is 14 cents flatter than an equally tempered third. A Pythagorean third is eight cents sharper.
So while our fifths are flawless, our thirds are pretty much unusable. But composers and theorists wanted those thirds, so two schools of thought emerged on how best to deal with this. The first is just intonation with higher limits. The second is mean tone temperaments. The limit approach had a millennium long head start, so let's check that out first. Pythagorean tuning is three limit. That means that the entire system is derived from the first three harmonics, unison, octave, and fifth. By opening this up to five limit, we get access to major thirds. So we can create a tuning that has both pure fifths and pure thirds. But again, there's a catch. Now we have several notes with multiple non-equivalent tunings. And if that's not enough, because our derivation is less consistent, we lose some of our already limited continuity between keys. But during the 16th century, a new tuning system was devised that combined the consistent fifths of Pythagorean tuning with a better approximation of the major third. It's called mean tone temperament. In mean tone temperaments, we stack fifths just like in Pythagorean tuning, but our fifths are tempered or counterbalanced. Major thirds derived from fifths tend to be sharp, so by flattening each fifth, we can improve our thirds. There are several variations on this concept, but the most common is quarter comma mean tone. A comma is an extremely small interval. When discussing historical mean tone temperaments, we're most often interested in the syntonic comma, which is equal to 81 over 80. This is the difference between a Pythagorean third and a pure ratio third. In quarter comma mean tone, we contract each fifth by a fourth of a syntonic comma. Or more specifically, we divide each pure fifth by the fourth root of a syntonic comma. This allows us to get a pure third with every four fifths. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. Other mean tone temperaments use different divisions of commas, but the core concept is the same. Mean tone temperament was arguably the dominant tuning system for over a century, despite having no pure fifths and being useless in a large number of keys. But the next set of tuning systems took a more nuanced, personalized approach to better balance flexibility and mathematical purity. Well temperaments are similar to mean tone temperaments in that they use tempered fifths, but the tempering is selective. To see what this means, let's look at three of the most common well temperaments, Workmeister 3, Workmeister 5, and Kernberger 2. But first, we'll need to talk about commas. We've already talked about the syntonic comma, which is the difference between a justly tuned major third and a Pythagorean major third. But there are two other intervals to be aware of. The first is a diatonic or Pythagorean comma. To derive a diatonic comma, stack pure fifths until you end up at your original note, seven octaves later. The difference between seven pure octaves and this massive stack of fifths is a diatonic comma. Now we have two intervals that are similar but not quite equal, so let's take the difference between those as well. This value is known as a schisma. So now that we have our terminology, let's check out Kernberger 2. In this tuning, Kernberger attempts to maintain the individuality of each key with pure thirds and fifths scattered throughout. To do this, he splits a syntonic comma in two and uses it to temper two of the fifths, the fifth between the second and sixth, and the fifth between the sixth and third. Are these even words anymore? To ensure a safe return to our tonic, the fifth between our tritone and minor second is contracted by a schisma. This tuning creates four perfectly just triads. Kernberger 2 has 9 pure fifths and 3 pure thirds. Unfortunately, it also has 3 Pythagorean thirds and 2 very narrow fifths. In Workmeister 3, instead of distributing a syntonic comma across 2 segments, we distribute a diatonic comma across 4 segments. The use of a diatonic comma allows us to circle back to our tonic without using a schisma. Compared to equal temperament, the notes in Workmeister 3 are pretty much uniformly flat. So the semitone between the leading tone and octave is a little wider than we might expect. But overall it sounds fantastic, and each key has its own distinct character. But Workmeister wasn't done. In Workmeister 5, he distributes a diatonic comma in quarters across six intervals. Notice the maneuver here. He narrows five fifths by a quarter comma, and then widens the fifth between the minor sixth and the minor third. The end result is shockingly close to today's 12 tone equal temperament, but with a pure fifth and a flatter major third in our home key. And speaking of equal temperament, 
In the 17th century, an Italian music theorist proposed dividing the octave into 31 equal notes. This 31-tone equal temperament provided usable approximations for a quarter-comma mean tone, as well as seven-limit ratios. Like all equal temperaments, 31 tet was based around the nth root of 2, where n is the number of equal divisions of the octave. So why is this how I introduce equal temperament? Well, it raises some interesting questions. If we had all the tools we needed to make equal temperament back in the 17th century, why did it take so long to finally make the switch? Let's go back to our mean tone temperaments for a minute. Consider the case of a 1 12th diatonic comma mean tone. The derivation would be exactly the same as any other mean tone temperament, but the result would be 12 tones equally tempered. And yet 12 tone equal temperament didn't achieve total dominance until the 19th century. So what happened? Well, as far as I can find, it came down to two things. Equal temperament was difficult for tuners to achieve by ear. Also, people just really liked pure thirds. Musicians and composers were hesitant to use equal temperament because to make every key sound okay, it removed the color from those keys and made every interval sound a little worse. I'm sure that a historian or a sociologist could put together a compelling examination of equal temperament as a result of industrialization because standardization opened instruments up to mass production. But even if the root cause was just a change in musicians' preferences, the lasting impact the 12 Tet has had on our musical world cannot be overstated. Equal temperament dramatically altered the way that we understand chromaticism and transposition. It's no surprise that atonality emerged shortly after it became the dominant system. It made key centers fungible and lessened the qualitative differences within chord types. From the jumping tonal centers of bebop to the upshifting modulations of love on top, 12 tet is a prerequisite for many of the compositional techniques that we now take for granted. And now with a century of recorded music in equal temperament, it's ratio tunings that sound alien and out of tune. But if there's any moral in this overgrown monstrosity of a video, it's that there's room for both. So experiment with intonation, try out some historical tunings, or even create your own. You'll learn a ton, and most importantly, you'll begin to hear the specific character of equal temperament. When something is ubiquitous, it becomes normalized. It becomes concrete, mistaken for bedrock, and we lose sight of its unique qualities. To really appreciate 12-tone equal temperament, we have to step out of it for a second. So play some ratio thirds. You'll be glad you did. Over the next few weeks, I'll be going more in depth into a few specific tuning concepts. So if there's anything that you want to know, whether it's a mathematical quirk or a specific historical tuning, toss it in the comments and let me know. Until then, like, subscribe, etc. On that beat, thanks for watching.